Hi, welcome back to Pakistan Explorer. Today we are going to be discussing a bit of uh, about commercial climbing, uh, which is so rampant these days. And as we speak, we have just a bit of a controversy going on in Manaslu. Clients don't actually go all the way to the top of the Manaslu, and rather they just stay short of about uh, 150 meters horizontally, uh, which is the end of which is also the end of the fixed line. And the top of Manaslu uh, needs a bit of a traverse all the way down. It's about 80 degrees of slope that you have to go down, and then you have to make the traverse and go on top of the, the peak on the other side. This has been going on for so many years, especially since the advent of uh, this commercial climbing when the, the companies and outfits have started taking the clients all the way to the top. and. Uh, people who have been aspiring to climb all 8,000ers in the world uh, uh, have realized that they have actually not been able to uh, reach the top of Manaslu, one of the uh, important 8,000ers. But apart from all this controversy on Manaslu, we have to kind of zoom out of the whole issue that's been going on on Manaslu and to what has happened in all these times, in all these years that have led us to this debacle on Manaslu today. And uh, I, was, I was going through uh, some of the, the articles um, written on this commercialization of climbing, and I came across this, this title that said, Preparing the Mountain for Climbing. The, the, the process of fixing the rope and breaking the trail and um, hauling the loads on high camps, setting up the high camps and taking the oxygen bottles and food supplies all the way to high camps and then taking the clients up to the summit is actually now being called as preparing the, the mountain for climbing. And I think just about a decade ago or maybe 20 years ago, the climbers were more interested in preparing themselves uh, to tackle the mountain rather than preparing the mountain uh, for their climb. For instance, like Everest, every year about more than 800 people summit Everest, the highest mountain in the world, which is obviously uh, the top of the bucket list on every rich man on earth, right? And the accident ratio also has drastically dropped because obviously the, the technology is evolving and the Sherpas have the right expertise now. Most of them are IFMG certified guides. And uh, because most of the climbs are aided climbs, most of the climbers are clients and not really the climbers. So obviously they have brought down the accident ratio drastically, which obviously encourages a lot of rich people around the world to actually give it a shot. But this is not what climbing was all about. Climbing is a sport which is inherently the outcome of uh, the exploratory spirit of man. Climbing has always been about the happiness surrounding it, you know. Climbing has been a celebration of life. Climbing has been a celebration of fitness and endurance, you know. Commercialization happens in almost every sport across the world. And for instance, like Soccer has big money in it, you know. Uh, basketball has big money in it. Golf has big money in it, you know. Presence of money in these sports have actually helped this sport to evolve in a better way, you know. But when money comes into the equation in climbing, it has actually uh, brought the bar down dramatically. Today we have clients who can hardly put on a cramp on by themselves. They are using oxygen, which means they're they are not inclined to improve their fitness or to increase their endurance or to acclimatize, you know. We have clients today who have inadequate technical capabilities when it comes to technical climbing. And what they're doing is like just following the guide on a fixed line with the bottle oxygen on their back, with high camps already equipped with food and supplies, and rescue already at, at the back, you know. So, I mean, this is like tourism, and this is not climbing. If we, if we get a chance to read the, the pioneers of climbing, like the Bonatti and Messner and 
uh, Bonington and Kurtika and uh, Wilisky, so many big names, you know, they were all sheer hardcore alpine climbers. Most of them have done new routes on 8,000ers. Most of them have done climbing without oxygen in alpine style, you know. And most of, the, most of these climbers are some of the, the pioneers in terms of climbing. And, uh, but do we have pioneers right now as we speak? We have just a handful of uh, climbers who are actually in it for the passion of it, for, for the obsession of it, for the addiction of climbing. So the two things have changed uh, in the last two decades. Uh, Climbers have stopped preparing themselves for the mountains, rather they have started to prepare the mountain for themselves. And the other thing that has changed have turned around at 180 degrees. The climbers in the early ages were actually looking for sponsors to finance their projects that they have dreamed of. Unfortunately, the kind of climbers we're getting today, they are in a habit of designing a project which can actually get them as many sponsors on board as possible, you know. And which is completely a turnaround uh, in terms of the kind of school of thought climbing used to have. And as we speak, there are a couple of climbers, a couple of Pakistani climbers who are actually uh, trying to be the first Pakistani to climb all 8,000ers, which is obviously is not an ordinary thing and some of them are really good climbers. But the question is, you can be the first Pakistani to climb all 8,000ers, and obviously you're doing it uh, with the support of the Sherpas and um, fixed rope and, uh, you know, in siege style, and you have everything already done for you. You know, half of the job is already done for you. And you may be the first Pakistani to climb all 8,000ers, but, but outside of Pakistan, you would be just 70th or 80th climber to do so. And, and if, we, if we, for example, consider the case of Ali Satpara, uh, Ali had eight 8,000ers on, on his belt. You know, he could have easily gone over to climb the rest of the 8,000ers uh, to be the first Pakistani to do so. And he attempted Nanga three times in winters. And then afterwards, he goes after K2 in winters. And obviously, we know that he's not with us anymore. But the difference of philosophy is quite evident here. You know, Ali Satpara followed the, the school of thought of the pioneers. Now, we understand this is a time of uh, information highway. We have got social media. And we understand that a lot of good things have uh, happened because of social media. There have been places, uh, even in Pakistan, in far-flung places, northern Pakistan, which, has ne which have never been explored. And now they are experiencing, they're experiencing an influx of tourists, which obviously complements the economy uh, uh, of the place. But also social media has drawn in no vices, uh, which are actually not interested in the, the spirit of climbing and the philosophy behind it. Rather, they are in it for just fame and money. And I would like to conclude with, with this small quote. It's, it's a very comprehensive quote, and I think it gives a lot of clarity as to what is happening right now. It says, you climb a mountain not so that the world can see you, but rather that you can see the world. Thank you very much until we meet again.